Welcome, Greg Janukas, to the podcast Concert Queen Connect. So excited to have you here. (laughs) You're right here. Yeah. There we go. All right. So so stoked to have you here. Thank you for coming. Stoked to be here. Um, we have a funny, interesting first meeting (laughs) because yeah, you I met you through Jonathan Terrell. Yeah. And you're just a vibe. I, you know, we came over, you had this whole spread and just, I mean, I was like, wow, that is a cool motherfucker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in my home. In yeah. your home. I know. Like how many people get to just. Not a lot. Not a lot. Yeah. No, it's pretty, pretty private space. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Same. Little That's why selected. you're in my living room. Yeah, this is great. The so studio, a secret so private location that no one knows i was gonna let everybody know this was such (laughs) a cool recording production studio yeah don't drop a pin here no one needs to know not at all um well again happy to have you here and so for those of y'all that don't know um this man needs no introduction but i'm gonna give him one anyways (laughs) (laughs) greg i'm dying to hear it oh my goodness janukas yes i've been practicing his last name because it's spelled spelled differently i won't ask you to spell it okay um but again, just I went through a deep dive and kind of Instagram stalked you, interweb stalked you. You've got just this amazing resume of photography. So, so I passed want- the test. <laughs> okay. Read some articles. Again, you're a big deal. So really happy, really stoked to have you here. Thank you. But would love to just, again, if you want to kind of just tell the folks, you know, where you're from and how you got into photography. Oh, man. Uh, that's, that's a long it's story. A loaded it's question. way back, way back. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting up there. Um, well, I'm from Houston, grew up, born and raised there and, uh, been in Texas pretty much my entire life other than for the, uh, three years that I spent in South Florida, um, came back here and was still not shooting photos, uh, well into my thirties, um, and got married and went to a wedding for one of my best friends and decided to take a camera. And on that trip, I shot photos between all the drinking and sleeping. Uh, <laughs> and I sent him a photo album when I got home and, and he forwarded that out to his, his guest list, which was about 500 people. Oh, wow. And so I got a lot of, uh, of messages from folks saying that I should consider doing it for a living. And that was all I needed to quit my job <laughs> and wow. buy a camera uh, and kind of just huck myself off the edge. Um, and it took a while, I think, from that point on to to really believe that I'd become it. Uh, I would say close to six years wow. of shooting and selling myself as a photographer and actually knowing that, that what I was, that's what I was going after. But I think it was about six years before I actually felt settled enough to internally feel like I had become uh, what it was wow. I'd set out well, to what do. What was that turning point that you were like, okay, this is it? Oh, man. Uh it, it wasn't from any internal understanding. Um, it came mostly through external validation through the people that were asking me to work with them. Um, and fortunately, the people that I had become friends with and started working with at the beginning mm-hmm. uh, happened to have been really focused and sincere about what they were doing. And and that was kind of the inspiration when, when considering um, how to document something uh, that's as genuine as those people were. Uh, I had to find a way to be as genuine about it. And so I was extremely critical of myself and, and my wow. talent. So it's like someone else I know. It's a yeah. photographer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a common thread for most people that would be considered artists that that's still a hard term for me to accept as one to describe myself with. But, uh, I think it, even at its most difficult, I, I believe that that's what I am, um, creating work through some specifically personal vision and putting it out there for others to judge. Uh, so that's hard. It, I mean, it really like you is. said, that's a vulnerability <laughs> of, like you said, especially I'm sure like you said, when you were first getting started, there's that kind of, like you said, I'm sure like at a wedding and you were just casually doing it for fun. Oh, there's yeah, no I was, pressure. I was hammered. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you had something there, you yeah, know, there was something sure. there and it obviously was enough to, for you to pursue it yeah. and move forward with it. and Well, I was really dissatisfied with what I was doing at the time as well, um, which was typical of every job I'd had. Uh, really dissatisfied with the structure of going to work, punching a clock, having a product to sell that wasn't my own. It wasn't something I believed in. I wasn't extremely passionate about any of those other things that I'd done. Um, 
And I don't believe that anything I'd done had me surrender to it like this had. So I think that was the big difference in why I was able to find uh, whatever it is that made me look to you like a, a big deal. <laughs> you know, uh, Whatever it is, I'm not going to knock it because it seems to work and it sells some for me. Sells um, some, just yeah. a little bit. Well, I think there's more that can be sold, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I'd like to find a way to do it that's that's some representative of something that I can stand behind because that's the only thing I can sell. Uh, I have a hard time selling things that I don't believe in. So wow. hopefully whatever it is I find that sells more than what it is selling now. So uh, what I'll would you say? In. Yeah. So what would you say that again, like, like you're, you're selling these things, but like, what is your favorite thing to shoot? Like when you're out there, is it oh, still shots? Is it? Cause I mean, I, again, like looking at all the different things you've done it all. <laughs> so, I mean, you've been on, you've been on tour obviously yeah, with I've artists tour, and I, I would say my most natural, um, focus would be a journalistic documentary, um, of anything that I specifically love. Um, and until I fall in love with it, I don't feel like I'm telling it the way that feels similar. What's an uh, example of something that you've done like uh, that? Man, uh, any, any live music event coverage, shooting at a festival, uh, even with bands that I don't know, it's music that I've always loved and gravitated towards. Um, I can directly transfer my mind and heart and headspace to a certain time based on a song that plays or remember oh. a smell or somebody that I was with yeah. <laughs> at the time. So uh, for me, it's really easy to emote love through the visual aspect because I can connect to that feeling. Um, man, motorcycles, <laughs> yeah, shooting uh, specific types of motorcycles and people that live that lifestyle uh, it's easy for me to tell that story because I can, I know what it's like to be on one. I know what it's like to care about one, to care about people that live that lifestyle, even though that isn't really my lifestyle. It's, it's an aspect of, of mm -hmm. my life, maybe as a, <laughs> an accessory to who I am. Uh, whereas I do know people that live that life. Um, so it's easy for me to tell that story because I know intimately what it is to love love that so that's awesome um, so i mean there's yeah. two th huge things i mean that you touched on <laughs> one obviously is the music piece that i obviously really resonate with because i agree I, I love looking at photos of just like moments in time have you ever been to um modern rocks gallery oh for sure I'm sure you have yeah <laughs> um I love, yeah, love, love, love that gallery, place. Yeah. yeah, just again, but there's just all that history and all those kind of like never before seen photos and, you know, capturing those moments. And yeah. he's got a great collection of oh, photographers in there. He does. Impeccable. Yeah. I've had stuff in there at times. Uh, really? Yeah, but he's got such a stacked, <laughs> loaded collection. It's, it's hard to sell one of my shots when Jim Marshall or Bob Groon or uh, Scott Newton have their photos of he gave the me Beatles. a Scott Newton book. Yeah, wow, man, that's signed. I have to show it to you. Yeah, so you probably didn't buy one of my prints because <laughs> he, <laughs> well, he just you gave the book. me that. Yeah, <laughs> well, because he knows I was just like geeking I'm out over his you. stuff. But yeah. yeah, I mean, he's great, and we actually, I mean, we wanted to do something because again, like, there's always these stories behind these photos, and it's yeah. like you don't. That to me is literally again like why we're even doing this podcast is because there's stories behind people, there's stories behind artists, and all the creatives. And that was one of the things that I just, I love, I wish I knew all the stories. I want to learn everything and hear everything. And so we were even talking about doing something. I'd love to have you part of it. Um, but like doing something like that behind, like again, behind the photograph and cool. talking about these different stories. Cause I mean, people love that stuff, especially here in Austin. Let me There's, get my book ready. Yeah. Get that pen, yeah. get it signed. Oh, but I'm hoping yeah. But same. I agree. I mean, there is just something with music. And like you said, I think you're capturing that visual, like just to see some of these photos, like has there ever been a photo that you're like, oh my, like it was a total accident. I'm sure you have some of those, but what's been like your favorite accidental shot that was just something that was amazing. Does it have to be an accident? No. Okay. Um, man, uh, this photo that I took at Antone's nightclub. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, Antone's oh, yeah. is a legendary nightclub. In legendary Austin, nightclub. Legendary, like 46, 47 years, I believe. So some Somewhere like that in Austin. Everybody uh, that came through Austin or grew up in Austin uh, has played there. 
uh, if they were good enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, Leon Russell played a show. Um, my friend Jonathan Tyler, who, who's been an integral part in my journey, uh, introduced me to the entire Texas Gentleman crew, um, which I was with quite a bit. Um, wow. Uh, for the first couple of years. Um, I can trace most of my music connections back through Jonathan Tyler or my friend Michael Weed, who, who now works for Gary Clark Jr. Wow. But used to work for Jimmy Vaughn uh, when I met him uh, way before I was a photographer. So uh, Jonathan was opening a show during South by Leon Russell was playing and I showed up on my chopper just wired to the gills and parked in the back and walked in wasn't supposed to be backstage that night and just found a spot in the shout in the, in the shadows and crouched down and waited knowing that Leon would probably come through that door and that I had never gotten to shoot Leon before. And I may not get another chance, not knowing what trajectory I was on or uh, if I would ever even, you know, be asked to be anywhere near that. So uh, I sat around and waited. Uh, I had, my 35 millimeter film camera was all I brought and I had a roll of black and white film that I'd just loaded. Uh, and I sat and I waited for about 20 minutes, kind of struggling internally with how wasted I was. Uh, should I stay? Should I go? Should yeah, I stay? Should just I torn. Yeah. Cause, uh, I was, I was just like sweating. Feet were falling asleep. I was <laughs> hiding back there. I wasn't supposed to be there. And right around the moment where I was just like, okay, I guess I'm just going to I'm going to sit here until it fucking happens. And I finally talked myself into not even considering leaving again. And that was right when he walked in. Wow. And so he came in and he sat on the stairs and I happened to be backstage looking through the doorway to the stairs. And he came in and sat down wearing all white. Um, and so because he was wearing all white, when the handler that was with him was holding the door open to finish a drag or two of a cigarette, uh, he was lit up from the halogen lights that were shining in the, in the alleyway. So I raised up my camera, I snapped one photo, I looked down, checked my exposure and pulled it up again. And by the time I got it to my face, the door had closed, the light was gone, it was dark. So I got one frame I have goosebumps. It's like yeah. a dream. It's like a dream. Yeah, I got one frame and it was a dream. But I remember seeing it through the viewfinder as the shutter clicked, thinking about what I'd just seen as I advanced the film, checked the exposure, came back up and then it was like, it was like the image was seared in my head, but I only was catching like the ghost of it that was left because it had got everything went dark, and I was still seeing spots, you know, from, <laughs> from the flash, all the drugs. No, no oh, flash, the- <laughs> no flash. I was wired to the gills, um, and so uh, I reached forward and I tapped the security guard that was standing in front of me. He didn't know I was there, and I told him, "Man, if I got that shot, it's probably going to be the best one I've gotten all year." And he was like, "Oh." great get the fuck out of here <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> He's like, here? and you're done <laughs> and i was like goodbye so, sir <laughs> that's all i needed yeah uh, yeah and then i got some more shots of leon on stage but uh nothing like that and i knew that that f- shot was in the f- in the camera and so that that roll of film i just was like okay got to get home get it processed uh, and when i finally scanned it in and saw it it was it was eerie um it was almost prophetic and leon passed away six months later uh, I was not going to get another chance to see or shoot him. And it was the first time I'd seen him. And thanks to my friend, Jonathan, I, I got that opportunity. So um, wow, the photo nice. is of him looking very ghostly, very tired. And the man whose knee I tapped uh, was a security guard. You can see this dark shadow of him and it looks as if death was coming for him. Uh, and it, it gives me chills thinking yeah. about it because I couldn't look at the photo after that for a while. And then, he had, uh, he had passed away, I believe, just before I had my art show. Uh, and I had the photo up displayed and people were asking about it. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people didn't even know who it was. So, wow. Uh, but yeah. Anyhow, the one crazy, of my favorite moments. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. I just can't even. So uh, black, you mentioned black and white and uh, I was kind of reading. So you're a re- really big fan of like black and white photos. So tell me, I guess, that versus the colored prints. Oh, man. It, it's just always was like, for some reason, seared into my mind that, that that was classic, iconic music photography was black and white, you know. Uh, 
never really took a big interest into like studying it or, or finding out who these photographers were uh, until I started shooting music. And even then I had a hard time looking at other people's work uh, because I would compare myself to it. And, wow. and I had to get to a place where I just didn't um, because it, it was pretty brutal. Um, like comparing, like you're saying these shots. Comparing of- what I do to what they were doing uh, when all I really wanted to do was emulate that timelessness um, and to get to a place where I could see things happening as they were happening and also see them or put them in the camera the way that I see them uh, or the way that I want them to appear. Um, so emoting certain or, or implying certain emotions and things, movements, uh, um where I weighted my subjects and and how I shoot and what I shoot for environmentally rather than just the person holding their instrument at the microphone, you know, trying to get things that actually described what everybody that wasn't there was missing. Um, So looking at other people's work and seeing these images that inspired so much of a nostalgia or a longing to have been there, it was hard for me to look at that stuff when that's what I wanted to create and feeling like I was born too late to do that for so long, even though I was doing that with the guys that were doing what they were doing Mm -hmm. uh, as passionately as Dwayne Allman or (laughs) Dickie Betts or any of those, you know, Johnny Cash and Waylon and Willie, those guys back in the day. So it was really hard for me to look at other people's work. And so I would just kind of like try and, keep away from it enough to not really even know who took that photo that I really fucking love. You know, yeah. the Folsom prison shots of Johnny Cash, uh, you know, iconic, iconic images, but it was like, I didn't know who took those until, I don't know, six or seven years ago. <laughs> yeah. Five years ago. Um, and I've only been shooting for, uh, going on 12 years now. So black and white to me felt more timeless and more classic. And it felt more like, what I subconsciously associated as uh, real music photography, even though I've worked on photo teams and I know people that only primarily shoot color Mm -hmm. and their photos are hard for me to look at still. (laughs) It's like, it's so fucking good Uh, because I I see in other people's ability what I lack in my own. Um, And the funny thing about that is I've had photographers whose work I admire implicitly, like, like a depth stick to see what it is that I still lack <clears throat> have come and told me like, wow, I wish I could do what you do. And it's so weird and foreign to me because it's like, I wish I could do what you do. <laughs> That's cool. And so I think it's, it's something that I've become a lot more accustomed to understanding and accepting in myself is that it's just, that's, that's just where I wait my passion. You know, that's just what I gravitate towards more. Wow. Too. So, well, it's like, you're all different too. Like everybody has their different styles and you know, I, I think that's part of the beauty too yeah. of looking at all that photography is that it is all different. If it was all just homogenous and everything looked exactly <laughs> the same, then it wouldn't be worth what it is. And it wouldn't, you know, just well, the moments it's through your eyes. Sure. Uh, and it was through those moments in my eyes that I, I identified the truth about myself. So um, that idea of what it was that I thought was unattainable for me. It wasn't until I started to see that I'd attained it that I started to recognize that, oh shit, there's something wrong with my story about me. And so it was through that search of light for light um, that I found those dark corners in my own heart and realized or recognized my heart being broken. And that I've been walking around with a broken heart most of my life. (laughs) Really? Yeah. So which, was there like which a defi- yeah cued in all the drugs and alcohol and you know yeah uh, but again like would I have thrown myself so fully into it so I don't I don't say that with regret just recognition you know well, yeah it's part it. of your story and you wouldn't be who you are <laughs> had that stories. not happened <laughs> yeah but but again that's like I feel like too we have all these different lifetimes like I'm sure there's things oh, that you remember like I've lived in a couple different cities and I look back and I'm like. Oh my God, like that just seems like such a foreign person to me. And it's so yeah. interesting too. I feel like as you, you know, move on through life and 
even as I see, like, I'm just a completely different person than I was. Thank God, right? I'm, I love it. I mean, I'm, I kind wouldn't change it, shit. but it's so, exactly. <laughs> but it's just so crazy to be like, wow, like, how did I go through life? Or And again, it's like, we're always constantly evolving and changing. And I think, like you said, there's, there's all that self-improvement work, but there's also, also just kind of stopping. And like you're saying, like being cognizant of like, this is where I am now. Yeah. This is who I am. And you're owning that. But also being like, this is where I've come from. There's, oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's especially with. I got a lot of lives to look back at. <laughs> you know, I came through a lot. I came, yeah. So you said, in again, like you know, drugs, alcohol, that stuff, yeah. and your life has obviously changed since then. Yeah. Okay, tell us yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't go out as much. Mm -hmm. Not as many people get invited over to the house. <laughs> See, but, I'm, I'm very special. I yeah, feel honored. Totally. Uh, and I'm really glad that you showed up at the house. That was uh, quite a fortuitous meeting. Yeah. But as far as changes go, specifically to the work, um, there was a long period of time where I, I wasn't sure I would be able to stop those things because they would affect my ability to be what I had finally become. So that was, wow. Yeah. That was, that was the real like mind fuck in that is like, okay, now I know I need to stop, wow. but how do I stop and continue to be what I am? Do I have to reject everything? And so being able to like go out, try, cause a lot of times in Austin music is being, <sighs> sold right next to the booze. So uh, if I'm going out to see music, I'm probably going to see a lot of booze and blow mm -hmm. and, you know, be face to face with it. Uh, that had not been the challenge for me. It was more about like, how do I continue on? How do I still keep the same edge in the work? I was afraid that it would be less edgy, less attractive. The people that liked my work would no longer like it. Wow. You know, so I was trying to manage all this other shit going, how do I do all that and stick to what I need. And what I found was that I became much more efficient. Really? You know, yeah. I w I, it wasn't as slow. And in something that is happening in life speed and you have to be ready and quick and agile. And if you miss a shot, not to fucking, oh, crash, man, fuck. You know, which was never my deal. But not being hard on yourself. Uh, and booze helped me not be hard on myself but I found that I was really efficient at the things that I was usually hard on myself about. Wow. So, <laughs> so did you find yourself, and like you said, you mentioned trade. like the, were those things, and it's like we all, we, we psych ourselves out. It's like that imposter syndrome that I feel like a lot yeah. of people have where you're like, like what you were saying, like, oh, if I stop doing this, they're not gonna like me or they're not gonna like my shot, like my shooting. And I'm sure there was nobody even telling you that. It was just. No, I think the people that don't, I mean, I don't know if anybody likes me or doesn't like me. That's really none of my fucking <laughs> they business. They like you. But, they really like you. Uh, you know, certain people quit texting and calling to see what I was doing, you know, and that's cool. And that fits uh, their life. Totally. But, you know, I also wasn't reaching out either. So mm -hmm. I, I don't take it as a personal thing. And, and I don't, most, most folks, there's no love loss when I run into them. Everybody's really excited to see one another. Mm -hmm. I know that I am at least to see old friends, uh, you know, I've, I've had some that I would run into and it was just, man, man, I hope this guy's doing all right. You know, cause some of us, you're hoping they're doing how, all right or hoping. Yeah. Cause you know, that's something that I missed, uh, when I was just partying with folks is how much pain they're walking around with sometimes. You know, uh, I think I've become much more empathic, uh, and it maybe not more empathic, but I'm at least attuned to it. Now mm -hmm. I can feel those things. I might've been feeling it just you know how to turn it off. You can't. Okay. So I okay. want to totally, I, again, like when I met you, yeah. you know, we're sitting outside and we're on uh, sitting around the fire. Yeah. And I mean, you just like zeroed in on like heard mm. what I was saying and I'm a life coach. So I actually mm. have like gone and That's why I feel gone so good to with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look at you. You're about to pump me up, aren't you? <laughs> Go ahead. But it was, but I can recognize it. So yeah. it's like, and again, talking about these different lifetimes, like I lived in Dallas for four years, right. which is very long four years. But yeah. Any time in Dallas is a long time. <laughs> it is too long for me. Sorry, I mean, Dallas friends. It. But yeah. for me, um, that city just didn't resonate with who I wanted to be and where I was. And there was some trauma there and things that I was working through sure. that pushed me to become a life coach and go through that. And I even went, I did the Dallas comedy house when I was there. So again, these little chapters, I'm, a, I'm an achiever. Right. So I like to go for a new goal and then just check it off. And 
it's, but it's so interesting. Like we're talking about who I am now and like the culmination of that. I'm sure again, like all these things that have brought you to where you are today, but like being the life coach, being those things, I'm able to hear, like I listen and you pick up on things and that comes from like the improv and listening because you have to listen to You're respond right. to people. But it's so interesting too, when you're talking to people and you can pick up right away, like their insecurities and it's just, but when I was at your house and we were sitting outside, I mean, you not only, and there was no sugarcoating it. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like, again, like my, my worth. Yeah. Yeah. It was about like my worth and, you know, recognizing that, but you, I mean, most people will kind of either one, just not say anything, you know, just kind of let that be. But like you cared enough just meeting me to call me out. (laughs) (laughs) I'll say what I want in my fucking house. (laughs) Well, you did, but but it was great. But that was what I needed to hear. And that was one of those things where, you know, you're like, damn, someone that doesn't even know me that well is able to see that in me and recognize that. And that Mm -hmm. is something that I'm working on and something that, you know, again, it's like you want to, especially during these times right now, you know, and, and with what's going on and we're all affected differently, but like for me, it's always the greater good. That's my, my love and my intention. And what I want is to help people. Um, and that's why I even started my whole thing was because it's about promoting and bringing up other people, but then you tend to sacrifice yourself in those situations for that exact reason. Like, Oh, well, you know, I want to help this person out. I know that they're hurting too. Right. And you get, but you can only do so much of that. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, no, I need to actually like dig, put some boundaries in place. For for me, you know, I hear what you're saying, and that that's uh, that is what drives you to be a life coach. You are qualified for it because you're driven to it. You know, nobody can tell you you can't be that. Um, you can assess your own value or worth in that, and somebody could try and tell you you're worth so much more. But until you rise to that self awareness and that acceptance. Mm-hmm you probably won't achieve what someone else is telling you you're worth. Um, And that overarching idea of like the greater good for whom Um, for me and my experience and what I'm really gifted at is the time that I have with somebody, you know, rather than like, obviously I hope that whatever I do benefits all of mankind. But in my experience, I only have whoever's sitting in front of me and Mm -hmm. in that space, I want it to be as meaningful um, and as gifting and receiving as possible. So uh, in shooting photos, which I I think I am better at that for my empathic ability, uh, for my intimacy or my desire for connection, um, my desire to allow people to be vulnerable and maintain a space that allows them to open up or show me who they are. I, I am more qualified for what I do or what I've chosen to do because of that. It's no surprise that I have chosen a profession that allows me to use my natural unaware talents and that I validated more for the things that I do already on my, wow, somewhere inside I chose this. (laughs) So for me, having you show up at my house and searching for a way to connect with you on an intimate level, it was just a matter of time until I found that thing. Oh, you're like a sniper. You well, just <laughs> you I found am. it. I have to shoot you. Yeah, you yeah. know, like <laughs> I have to take a <laughs> Do you have his camera? Yeah. Do you uh, want me to smile? This what do will I be do? on the website, and she will <laughs> hyperlink you to my Instagram. <laughs> Promo drop. That's right. Okay, so yeah, I think that. I have honed that skill and I am even better at it. And just like snapping the photo, I'm more efficient at that as well. Um, I am listening. I am always looking for a way to see who somebody really is. That's what I want to shoot. Like we can style and, you know, theorize what this image needs to look like. And we can have a creative director and a whole team on board and the makeup and the hair and the fucking blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But ultimately I, I just want to get you in front of the camera and see how we fucking dance. Like something's going to strike. We're going to connect. And then it's just going to be like, oh my God, here it is. We're here. Wow. And how do we prolong that? I want to edge like a motherfucker for the whole yeah. time, <laughs> you know? So, well, and that's interesting because, you know, I feel like too, as a photographer, and again, this is something that, again, my friend and I talk about all the time. But when, as a photographer, you're put in these very intimate situations where sometimes, you know, he's mentioned to me as well, like you're there with, it's just you and the artist backstage and you're in a very intimate setting where no one else is allowed. And 
I mean, I'm sure there's been some moments for you that again, like, and you don't have to name names, but has there ever Man. been a time where you're like, wow, like this person's really opening up to me in that environment? I mean, constantly it's, and it's one way or the other. It's, it's, it's not just a two-sided coin. You can feel it going in one direction. You feel it come back or I do. I can feel it going in a direction. I can feel where they hit their wall or where they back off, where I'm allowed to go. Like in, in, in becoming what I am as far as specifically like a music photographer and being able to go on tour, being asked to go on tour, it's either granted, you know, or requested that I come. I can't go and knock on the door and say, hey, I'm going with you, you know, I mean, maybe I can suggest it <laughs> and then they hey, might consider it, I mean, yeah. but literally it's, it's, it's an access granted or not granted situation. You know, I can't go in there and take something from it. Uh, and then I can't go in there and take something from it with their permission and then misuse it and be expected to be brought back. So there's it's just a level of integrity is required. Um, so yeah, I'm constantly looking for the way to maintain my invitation and uh, you know, childhood wounding attachment theory, all that <laughs> shit plays into it. And I happen to be really um, well suited uh, for it. So how so. would you say again, like just that whole, that dance, you know, getting invited to the dance, like how does that, how's that conversation occur? And I guess from like beginning to <laughs> when you first you just it? started, well, uh, I'm curious. Uh. <laughs> Here we go again, Greg. Greg's getting his backstage pass. <laughs> Get a look. That's how. That's how he got his backstage pass. Yeah. Um, no. But how? Oh, yeah. But I mean. Aside. But how did you? Like you said, what? What is someone looking for? Is it strictly your work? Is it through a referral from a friend? Or how are they? It goes both ways. I mean, it goes all ways. Uh, it doesn't come through a website or me handing out business cards or selling myself. Really, I, I've never. I've never done that. I've never owned a website and I'm hoping that changes in the next six months. <laughs> uh, I've never handed out a business card. Uh, I don't think that that's not true. Um, right at the very beginning, I think for the first year I had a thousand business cards made and I think I threw 600 or 700 of them away. Wow. It was just like, uh, what did I waste my money on this thing for? Um, and back then I didn't even use my name attached with my work. I had an alias that I hid behind. Really? Because I was too insecure to like attach my name to the brand in case it sucked. Wow. What was your alias name? <laughs> well, it, I I didn't introduce myself as this, but my, my website was Elojo Photo. Or, okay. You know, it's Spanish for the eye. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to that because I was partly raised by a Mexican immigrant. Uh, I first started getting interested in photography in Mexico at a wedding. Uh, and it felt like a good homage or like an, you know, the ojo. Yeah. yeah. El ojo. The el ojo. Until I started meeting photographers whose work I really loved and looked up to. And, you know, like, who are you? I'm like, uh, the I. Yeah, literally. <laughs> the, 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 well, I'm, oh, so I'm Mexican. The I, yeah. I'm the I. <laughs> the I is the I. And I'm talking to people who I've, respect as yeah. having one of the greatest eyes ever. Wow. Know? Yeah. And so it felt very egocentric and it didn't feel appropriate. Uh, and then it also felt like I was hiding uh, and it was time to. So then you shifted to yeah. your name. And it, man, there's uh, man, a friend of mine, Allison Naro. Do you know Allison? I'm not, I don't think so. Allison's a local photographer, but she was the head of the fun fest photo team for years. Uh, and, uh, saw a photo R. that R. I took of Z Lee. Oh. Uh, and the photo that I took was during the X Games bid party that was happening all over downtown Austin. Uh, and he was on stage. And it was this amazing shot. Of He's him, a like, crazy. Oh he I mean, great. he does this thing. Zeely, I'm going to send you this. He does this like that where he yeah, always jumps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right here. Right. But he's always I mean, I love that jump that he's yeah. just so energetic on stage. And we were talking about so. We're talking about Zeely of Black Alac, um, but yeah. there's also, they're part of, you know, there's Franchise, yeah. who I was literally texting with yeah. right before this. Great and again, I was looking at your guy. photos. Um, since I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a video girl <laughs> in their music video. Um, but perfect. He, he gave me the nicest compliment, <laughs> though. He's like, we yeah. want someone. It's, it's for a song. I don't know if I can even, well, I'm talking about it, whatever. Um, it's called Nice. And they're like, it's about 
you know, a girl who is nice, but it's not like classy, but still sexy. But mm -hmm. he's like, so can you find three other girls that are just like you? <laughs> and I was like, that's Aw. a tall order. <laughs> and he wants to have a party, order. apparently. <laughs> I wish I could call somebody and be know. like, get three more girls three just, just like, like you, you and then holler at me. Yeah, that's what he did. Okay, friend, I'm going to be at your house later <laughs> with four girls. <laughs> we working on it, homie. He's, he's, so, he's such a trip. So I know him. Yeah. I saw him when he was a solo artist. Yeah. Back in San Antonio, there was a, God, what was that? It was Ma, not Mala Luna. It was one of the festivals that was there and he was like playing at like two o'clock as a solo artist yeah. and it was just so fun. And so I just kind of, one of my other mutual friends, Cardick, introduced me to him. I love Cardick. Do you know Cardick? I do. Yeah. I went to high school with Cardick. Yeah, he's incredible. He's a man. Yeah. He's Krishna's little brother. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's how I met I Krishna. Know the crew. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I met, yeah. So cool. that's how I met Card. Like I literally went to go see Cardick's band. Fran came out and was like, you know, so I have yeah. a photo. I should pull that up. But it's like, you know, when we're, we're like babies and I'm just there, like, you know, supporting them. And then when I moved to Austin, that's when I saw, um, met Zeely and Zeely again, like just that crew is just amazing. So a <laughs> highlight for me too, I, was yeah. like the Austin music awards this yeah. year. I like made sure, um, you know, they won best hip hop group yeah. this year. And I was like, I'm giving them that award. Cause I was the awards Vanna white yeah. of the Austin music awards. So I got to, I nice. made sure I was like, I'm giving them this award. These are my homies. Hell so I yeah. got to give them the award on you had stage. Yeah, that much pull up there on stage. You're like, I'm gonna give it to. Well, just the, the it was the, those Didn't girls. Even read those girls did not even care. I know. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't me. But I was the girl. Yeah, I was the one that was like walking up there, you yeah. know, giving them the awards. And I mean, that was. But again, this is like what I was saying, like me supporting those artists. So yeah. when the Austin Music Awards asked me to be, like, you know, to be like someone that's, I was like, this is literally like a complete metaphor for what yeah. I want to do is literally reward these artists sure. for what they're doing and. You know, Tamika Jones was there. Everybody well, was there. So that was the funny that was thing a about Black Lag is <laughs> I was shooting Gary's. Uh, he did three sold out shows at the Paramount Theater of his solo performance a couple years ago. I can't remember what year it was. I think 17, 2017, maybe. And after the show, we all went walking around partying and ended up back in Gary's room at the end of the night. And Gary started playing some beats he'd made. Really? Yeah. He loves like And that's when Black Lack started that Really? Night, uh, in the hotel room that night. What? That was the beginning of Black Lack. So you were there. That's <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a great story. Yeah. You've got some really amazing <laughs> shots too of Gary. Oh man. Yeah, I've been fortunate. He's been really really friendly to me over the years. So. And I love how he just reps Austin so hard. I yeah. mean, cuz he's been from the beginning he's about it for sure this is his home yeah and he's gonna tell the world yeah yeah that's really cool because and he just supports zeely and fran i mean those are his, his so boys. yeah those are his yeah. boys but it's but everybody that he can yeah you know, people that he believes in and knows and he cares about that in my experience that's what i've watched him do uh with quite a few folks uh, it's really it's really cool. It's always special. Yeah. You always you always have to think because I went. When was it? Black Lock had a show last year at Scoot In, so I was there. I, you know, I was there hanging out with Zeely, and then he's like, "Oh, he's like, I think he's like, we got to go. I think Gary's Gary wants to make a, an appearance and pop on for a song, and cool. you know, so yeah, it was really really fun. Like they're just again like the whole scene here in Austin, as I'm sure you've seen, is just completely evolved and changed. But you know, just seeing these these artists that are just so freaking talented. I mean, they have just such like a pool here of all different types of people from like. Yeah, you ought to check out the photography scene. There's some fucking phenomenal photographers. Tell me about some of your favorite photographers that you like to. Man, that's a tough one because I'll, f I'll forget people. Um, but I mean, immediately everybody that I was on that Fun Fest team with, uh, Dave Mead, Jackie Young, Pune, uh, Pune Ghana. Dude, How do I she's know Pune? A God, because you've listened to every band she shot. Probably. Okay. She's yeah, I know that name. Uh, Allison Naro, Chad Wadsworth, Daniel Cavazas. Like, uh, there's so many more. Uh, but yeah, that's RIP, the immediate, fun, fun, you know, fun fest. The immediates. Uh, and then I so many great photographers reach out to me from Austin uh, asking if I have assistant gigs or if I have time to hang. And honestly, I've I've made time for quite a few and probably missed a few. I try and respond to every email and message that I get from somebody because wow. when I was starting, I remember specifically sending out, you know, 20, 25 emails 
and getting three responses. <laughs> and so and what were you asking? Like when you were what I should be doing, you know, how do I do this? Is it like, should I be this or should I go to school? Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and the three that responded had the same answer. It was like, you're not going to learn anything in school that you, you know, that you can't learn just by going out and doing it. Right. And you're going to have to do it to understand it anyways. So, um, just take a camera with you everywhere. Yeah. Shoot. And if you have a question about it, shoot some more. Wow. <laughs> you know, so, uh, that was pretty much the most real advice that I got. And it turned out to be pretty much the only advice I was given. Wow. Um, so that's really cool. Yeah. So you've done like fun, fun, fun fast. I also noticed you had, so Newport folk fest. Yeah. Wow. I have not been to that music festival yet, but I have, it's literally something, like I said, my friend always talks about, um, he's from there. So it's yeah. really cool to see, I guess, just all the different festivals. There's just so many. Man, I get chills thinking about Newport, like that that place. Yeah, tell me about that. Cause again, there just seems to be so much history uh, there. Not man, only with- The most. Yeah. Some of the most history for music festivals is there. Um, I don't remember how many fucking years, but George Ween started that festival and Jazz Fest, Newport Jazz Fest as well. Uh, never had any experience with Jazz Fest because usually I was just heading back uh, to Texas after folk. Um, but I've never been to a festival. I had never been to a festival like that until Newport um, where the accessibility of the artists to the fans was so great. There was so little barrier between being a fan and being a performer other than the fact that you got to go on stage and perform and that there were some small areas that allowed just the artists just so they could have some breathing room. But being out there on the grounds at the fort, uh, I mean, people just didn't get anybody in anybody's shit. You know, it was like there they were all mingling and doing their thing. And I liked that the, the festival wasn't overserved. Uh, they didn't have a lot of service yeah. points for, for getting hammered. And so it just had this really mellow, chill vibe and a high caliber of quality of music and uh, musicianship. Uh, the performances were great. And then you'd have these like really fucking epic, epic artists, legacy artists that would show up and, and just. Yes. Yeah, so tell me about stage. that. Like I said, Steve, obviously um, producer is from <laughs> Rhode Island. Yeah. So I, have heard some stories, well, but what's... okay. So my first experience was probably the most epic for me. It, it definitely was the most epic at that time. And I think it'll stand out for me for a long time because of that being one of the, the moments that actually showed me more about myself that created the start of my changing my life. Oh, um, I can't wait to hear this. Yeah. It, I mean, my friend Bo Bedford, uh, who's a producer, uh, was a member of the Texas Gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, he hit me up one day and was like, hey man, we're gonna do Newport and we're going with Joe Ely, Terry Allen, and Chris Christopherson. Do you wanna go? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I don't know, man. Gonna twist my arm on that How one. How much is it paying? <laughs> <laughs> know your worth. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to need some money. <laughs> Five minutes later, I get a call. There's no money. Okay, I'll be, I'm in. <laughs> but I appreciate you asking. Yeah, you still course. had to ask the questions. Yeah, see? yeah. There I you needed, go. I needed to Negotiation try. 101. Yeah, I wasn't a very good negotiator apparently, <laughs> but, but I got a lot out of it, you know. Um, man, first of all, Joe Ely. Terry Allen and Christopherson. Wow. Fucking any one of those would have been a dream. And all three was, man, it was like dying and going somewhere. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, but well, yeah. So you were just we're rolling shooting, with them the yeah. whole time. And well, you know, with the gents, we took a bus up to Newport and we stopped it in Nashville along the way and had a party there. Uh, did a party at the Belmont Hotel in Dallas before we left. Mm -hmm. Oh, I uh, love the Belmont. And then hit Nashville and then went up to Newport and then jammed for a couple of days and then mm -hmm. jammed back down to Nashville. And then, When you say jam, <laughs> I just picture you like... Man, there's videos <laughs> on phones, cameras, and they were like, it was, it was jams. Yeah. Uh, but Christopherson was supposed to do like four or five songs uh, in this, in the museum stage, which is like this little bitty harbor room where... Uh, 
I guess on the fort where they used to have like uh, meetings, not full gatherings of all of the soldiers or sailors. It was just like a smaller room, wow. uh, a listening room. Um, I don't know how many people were in there, maybe a hundred just because they overcrowded it. I think it holds 70 people and there were people on the balcony just surrounding. You could have heard a pin drop in there when he started and he was only going to play for like 30 minutes. He went on for like an hour and 40 and wow. nobody stopped him. Obviously, nobody's going to stop him. He he just was like going and going. And it at a certain point, I'd taken so many fucking photos and I was just like, I got to take a break. Like this is emotional. I think I had cried at least once during the set and I went outside and sat down in our little artist area and I started looking through some photos and I recognized that the two kids that had played before him were sitting on the sofas with us, with me. It was just the three of us. Uh, and I was like, man, that's, it's so wild. This is so heavy. Like, how did y'all end up, you know, like you, you want to see some of these photos? Like, yeah. And so they're looking through them and, and, uh, one of them walks off and comes back and was like, Hey, this is my mom. Uh, would you mind showing her the photos? And so I'm like, yeah, sure. And I start showing them. Turns out it's Chris's daughter. And, and the woman she brought over is his wife, Lisa. And Lisa was uh, like, wow, these are incredible. What? Will you hold on a second? And went and grabbed who is now a friend of mine, Tamara Saviano, who, who's Chris's manager and brought Chris. Tamara over and Tamara was looking at him was like, Oh my God, we're, we're going to give you a tour laminate and call us whenever you want. And Lisa was going to put her phone number in your phone. And wow. You know, so like at that moment it was like, I was emotional already. And now I have to go to the bus to cry. Like, <sighs> I got to get, I can't even breathe. I got to go sit down and you know, in the bus peeling photos and, and recognize in mm -hmm. some of the photos that it was, that was, that was what I thought I was never going to attain. Uh, and again, why do I think I still suck? Something is off. Because here I am. No, you've had some pivotal yeah. moments just in this <laughs> conversation it's alone. Rooted that I suck, <laughs> and I'm going to have to get my ass kicked <laughs> to not believe it. <laughs> oh, but I mean, so. like you said, it's like those moments. It's so hard, and I think that's just like a natural thing where. Again, you probably you wouldn't be where you are if you well, were if you were just content. What being I said is that I'm no longer feeling like that is the case. I'm grateful great. for the fact that I, that's what drove me for so long. Yeah, and I'm also grateful for the fact that I've had this epiphanal change that feels much more secure and much more valid in where I've landed, and that I've earned my rights to to have a value, mm -hmm. um, and that I can stand behind it, whether people believe in it or not. Uh, it's up to me to enforce it or to believe it. Uh, and the more that I do that, the more I will see that my work is worth that. So, so was there, was there something again, cause you're talking about like these, like you said, these epiphany kind of moments, like was there one defining moment or was it just like the I steady wish. build of confidence? I that wish, you started? it would have happened long, long ago, okay. but it took me a lot of times. Uh, I, I had a lot of things deeply hidden from myself. And so my ability to use a load of cocaine and a load of alcohol, and still maintain functionality, like mm -hmm. a high functioning uh, drunk and drug addict. Um, those things were progressed so deeply buried that it, it took a lot of instances to like really, okay, this one spurred a small change because that net of safety that I'd built subconsciously, you know, or interdependently like that, that kept me really safe. Even mm -hmm. though I was not living safely, it kept the ego safe. Uh, and it took a while to start breaking that down. And I'm still learning more and more every day, yeah. you know, facing so, things that are challenging. And, you know, like the last six months during this quarantine situation have yeah. been the most amazing in the last that's 10 not, years That's of not my a life. way that people <laughs> have been describing. I'm sorry. Like, oh, don't apologize. <laughs> but that's the thing. I, like, I, yeah. So what, again, like, and that's, like you said, in this last six months, I mean, everyone's life has been completely reset yeah. at some point. If you haven't like experienced that, then what's going on in your life? <laughs> because for me, unless you just like, that was your life pre COVID, you know, I don't see how you can't have some type of monumental shift in yourself. Well, yeah. But what was amazing? Tell like what well, those last I six mean, months. Like, so, so let's say from the Christofferson point, mm -hmm. um, you know, that Newport effect, it took, 
I don't know, man, maybe six months before I realized that like my marriage was falling apart and had fallen apart and that I was no longer really involved in what I had signed up for in that emotionally and nor was my wife. Uh, and then knowing that I needed to get sober and that that was going to require vulnerability and space between both of us, not just me, and that that no longer existed in my marriage. So I had to make the choice to leave in order to make the choice to like create the space for myself to get sober. Um, as I started to get sober, started to also grieve my father's death for the first time, which is wow. a lot of the things that were hidden within me. So, you know, ended up in a, another situation that was kind of like a replacement to drugs and alcohol. And that carried on for a little while while I still remained a little avoidant, a lot avoidant. Uh, and then eventually that fell apart and it became like, oh, there's nothing left as far as an exit from dealing with my shit. So I dealt with drugs and alcohol, gone. Dealt with this other distraction that will remain unnamed forever, gone. Uh, dealt with suicide. You know, that was always there somewhere hidden underneath. It's like wow. when you have that much pain and that much avoidance, wow, what's the only ultimate way to avoid? It's like, Oh, I could end it. So once all those exits were removed and then I was just like, okay, I'm going to get back to work. I'm going to focus on, you know, I was looking wow. for another exit. You know, I was like, I'm going to focus on work. I'm going to get reconnect with old buddies. I'm going to get back on the road. Six days later, South by's over canceled yeah. or in a pandemic. And it's like, no, you're not. You're going to sit at home alone. You're going to be alone. You're going to find healing modalities. You're going to focus wow. on all the shit. And I'd been doing therapy for years. You know, I'd been sober enough for years, but I'd been dealing with something else that kept me distracted from my own shit. And it had enough shit involved in it that I could spend my entire life not looking at my own wow. and taking care of someone else's. So once all that stuff was gone and it was really quiet and I had my super nurturing, cool, fucking styly house with all the cool things yeah, that you enjoy. Yeah, it's a museum. <laughs> it was easy to like yeah. just really settle in mm -hmm. and swimming every single day, thanks to my good friend JT Holt, who plays guitar with Kalu James, who's another very dear friend. Uh, those He's two awesome. guys have been like family to me. Wow. Um, yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like safe, nurturing, like down, like whatever I was going through, it didn't matter. You know, it was just like, I could be what I needed to be around them or I could just have a good time. It's amazing. You know? So uh, JT introduced me to swimming and uh, taking some mushrooms. So actually swimming <laughs> yeah. or like, cause I swimming, saw, yeah. was watching and not like we're like talking, not talking like a pool. We're talking about Barton Springs, right? Well, yeah, yeah. Barton Springs. Like in there, or like a cold plunge kind of. in Austin. Okay, and yeah. Also on the, the cold road, plunges. I've done 18,000 miles in the last four months. Wow. Um, yeah. We didn't even touch on that. All Those sorts of forests. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's a whole other episode. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like forests. Incredible. Uh, with glacier, water, melt, runoff, lakes, like the Oregon coast, Pacific. Yeah. Water as cold as 46 degrees, I want to say, was the wow. coldest. Just that shock to the system that you're getting from it. And I mean, uh, I hear you know, I everyone talks about it. It's just a shock to the system. It's like a meditative thing. You know, you, you, you get into breath work. Um, what is more grounding? Like when, when people say to ground and connect with yourself and like re-enter your body when you're going through stress or trauma or you need like peace and quiet to focus on your breathing. Um, yoga is a breath work practice. Swimming is as well because you're breathing in intervals and in a rhythm and your body is activated wow. and you you actually can do it mindlessly if you get to a point of comfortability in it where you're just like you're methodical so in the water i have this separation between my physical being and my consciousness you know i can like really contemplate things while my body is fluidly moving through the water and i can even have the focus in the water to become more streamlined or like okay, make minute difference, differences and like, okay, don't blow out as fast so that my breath will carry me through further. And then I can have a slower inhale when I finally turn my head. Wow. And so I'm having those conscious thoughts about my physical being. And at the same time, I'm existentially considering who I am and why am I dealing with this shit and how do I flow easier in that in my life? And so it's, it's a real separation of mind and body. Uh, and it, 
it's a great example to have like, oh, just little changes. Did in someone course. introduce you to that or was JT that, Holt okay. brought me out? And, wow. Uh, Were you like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, man, I, the water's fucking cold. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> like, like, I don't know. Who wants to jump into cold water even in the winter? Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a thing. Yeah. And that's helped not you. only got beyond like the discomfort of it, now go and seek it. Wow. Because of its therapeutic effect and how much it has assisted me to to find a way of life that helped me create more security and safety in, in my being. So that's awesome. So a lot of people don't. I mean, I think even in, you know, people's lives, especially like you said, when we had all these distractions and we were out doing all these different things, like especially concerts, you know, it's like somewhere to escape and not sitting there and doing the things that you necessarily would do if you weren't like if there was other stuff going on so having to be home and yeah i'm sure yeah. there's no distractions unfortunately i was distracted oh see i, I was texting you i know i had to you're texting me yeah <laughs> i was wondering if we could i have take two phones i have two phones well, we're actually wrapping up now are we yeah we're okay. already at an hour all right so that went by really that really was quick easy and fast. i know well like i said i really appreciate you being here today um i hope to have you again yeah how can people find you or if they want to again like look at your not find you the directly website. but yeah. the website or my home address y'all just come on by <laughs> apparently people find just, you that way yeah i'll give you a sad i'm yeah. just kidding um but how can people yeah if they want to like again because i know you you I sell mean, print do you, right do you now, still sell prints sometimes or you i, still, do, I know you, you did like to, a print sale there yeah yeah i did uh, recently i did a 36 hour print sale on instagram mm -hmm. um, and right now that is the only platform you can really find me through okay um as i'm working on developing a website i don't have a website up yet mm -hmm. um and i'll be working on a book as well nice. in this next month so hopefully starting to do layout and uh we'll see if that takes a year or two um i don't know but there's yeah. lots of content. So just keep, lots of keep stories. your eye open. Really, it's just my Instagram, at Greg Janukas. Uh, and I respond to almost every single message. Uh, and if I don't, send me another one. I'll respond to at least one awesome. of your two messages. And then you'll see him, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all over town. So, well, thank you so much again thank for you. being here. We'll definitely do this again. All and right. I know we'll hang. Come back over the house. Time. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> cool. So thank you so weather. much. You're welcome. We'll see you. All right.